start the meeting and we can start the introductory video now that would be great. January 7th, 2020, meeting of the Buncombe County Commission meeting to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Earlier this week, 3,500 additional military personnel who are stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina were ordered to prepare for deployment to the Middle East. So before we begin our meeting this evening, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence to recognize these military personnel and their families, and during which time you may offer a silent prayer for the safety of all of those who are serving our country. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. All right, I've got a couple of announcements. I uh, want to announce that we have parking validation for any folks who are attending the meeting this evening who parked in the county parking deck next door or who, or who utilized uh, the transit system to travel to the meeting this evening. You can get validation for parking or transit from one of the uh, officers who is uh, serving us here uh, at the meeting this evening. Please feel free to see them on, on your way out. We read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the Code of Ethics adopted by the Board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to avoid and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and transparent manner. <coughs> Is there any item on the agenda the outcome of which would have a direct substantial and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member. <coughs> Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting. All right, so we come to the um, agenda. Are there any questions from any commissioners about any item on the consent agenda? Are there any questions from any members of the public about any items on the consent agenda? All right. Um, we do need to have a what I believe is going to be a brief closed session at the beginning of the meeting. So we will do that immediately after approving the consent agenda. Are there any other um, questions about the remainder of the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the uh, agenda as published with the inclusion of a closed session following approval of the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. 
Uh, Ms. Hockaday, could you tell us the purpose of the closed session? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I need a motion uh, to go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3 uh, to consult with an attorney retained by the board for legal counsel um, for a discussion of the County of Buncombe versus Joe Wiseman, 18 CVS 4206. All right, is there a motion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, I think this will be a brief closed session. Uh, so we're in closed session now, and we'll be back momentarily to resume the remainder of our session. Motion to go back into open session. Second. All here, please say aye. 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 All right, we're back in open session. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing to consider the Fernwood rezoning request. And uh, Josh Freeman is going to get us started on this item. Good evening. Max, if you'll pull up the presentation, please. Okay, uh, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, the proposed rezoning before you uh, is uh, for the Fernwood uh, Mobile Home Park. Um, <clears throat> first, let me, oh, wrong presentation there, Mr. Max, that's the applicant's presentation. <laughs> if we could switch over to staffs. Thank you. We have two presentations for you tonight. So. There we go. Thanks, sir. Okay, so before you tonight is zoning public hearing 2019-45. Uh, uh, this is the Fernwood uh, zoning map amendment. Uh, the application before you was properly noticed in accordance with North Carolina General Statutes and Buckham County Code. Um, in your packet, you should have before you uh, an ordinance to approve should you choose to approve, uh, as well as a resolution to deny should you choose to deny this application. Your options, as always, in a rezoning are to approve as presented, deny as presented, or you can continue um, under guidance from, from uh, legal staff, uh, or you can remand it back to the planning board for further consideration. <clears throat> the applicant's information, uh, Mr. David Day of LCV Venture LLC is the applicant. Uh, the current owners are uh, Mr. John Carpenter, David Holdridge, and Paul Murray. The property is located off Charlotte Highway uh, along Fernwood Mobile Home Park Drive. This is an image of the subject properties. I believe there are four properties in total uh, on the west-hand side of Charlotte Highway, uh, just across the street from Hemp Hill Knoll Road. 6.39 acres in size. I say plus or minus 20 manufactured homes. There's 20 address points for that, for uh, as many as 20 homes in the property, I believe. There's between 18 and 19 present at the moment. Service well by public water and wastewater services. The rezoning request is to rezone the property from the current zoning district, which is R3, to commercial services, or CS. The map on the left is the current zoning. The map on the right is the proposed zoning. As you can see, there is commercial services zoning across the street, uh, across Asheville Highway, uh, from the subject property, so this would be a contiguous rezoning. It would not constitute spot zoning. 
just a brief summary of the two districts. R3 is your, is your highest density standard residential zoning district. It allows a fairly broad range of residential development types, um, primarily intended to be concentrated in areas where there's water and wastewater services. Commercial services, on the other hand, does allow the same broad range of residential uses, but also is more, more importantly intended for commercial uses clustered in, along major arteries, again, in areas where there's water and sewer services available. In terms of the dimensional requirements, your setbacks, things like that, uh, minimum lot sizes, there's very little difference between the two districts. The key difference is in the, is in the potential building height. Your tallest building height in R3 is 35 feet, whereas your tallest building height allowable in commercial services is 50 feet. Um, a couple of views of the properties from various angles, so you're looking north here. You're looking west, looking south, looking east. In terms of uh, land use plan analysis, uh, this is one that hits, uh, kind of it scores points on both consistency and inconsistency. Um, it is within reasonable proximity to measure transportation corridors served by uh, water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, it's outside elevations of 2,500 feet or greater. On the other hand, it does contain some limited steep slope areas on the western side of the property. Uh, some moderate to high hazard slopes, although those are largely kind of in transition areas, say along a roadway where you're, where there's a, a cut bank or a fill slope uh, related to the, the road access to the property. Uh, it is in the floodplain. I think this is a key point uh, in the comprehensive plan. The land use plan, sorry, does recommend uh, that um, it suggests that commercial uses be directed away from floodplains, and it also suggests that such uses be directed away from low, low density uh, residential areas. From staff's perspective, this is largely compliant with your with your land use plan, um, specifically for the three reasons listed in blue. It's outside of high elevations, it's near services, it's along a transportation corridor. Um, the steep slope areas on the property, the, the land use plan uh, recommends avoiding areas of 25% slope or greater. Your zoning ordinance really regulates areas of 35% or greater. Uh, most of the areas that are st steeply sloping on the property are to the far west, kind of uh, where the topography jumps sharply from the, from the river valley up to the, um, to the crest of the ridge behind at the back end of the property on the western side. Wish I had a visual to show you. Um, and so it's largely areas that wouldn't be subject to a lot of development. Um, also, from a floodplain perspective, this, is a, this was a tough one for staff and for the planning board as we work through the analysis. The, it is in the floodplain. Um, however, it's also adjacent to a major corridor serviceable by utilities. Uh, and it's currently developed as a manufactured home park. The park was developed prior to the current floodplain development regulations. Uh, so most of the homes are, are, are older units that are, are even pre-HUD units in, in, in some cases. Most importantly, that project is not developed in compliance with the current floodplain development regulations. Uh, and there have been prior flooding events that have impacted that site. So from a rezoning perspective, staff feels that this would actually create an opportunity to, re to redevelop the site in a way that's more compatible with potential flooding conditions in the future. Um, as far as the low density separation is concerned, uh, if, if I go back to a map here real quick. So if you're looking uh, north again, most of the higher sloping or the, the steeper slopes are to the west side of the property, so to the, to the left hand side of your screen. Um, the low density residential uses that abut this property are all at the top of that slope set back from the edge of that slope. So whatever commercial development might happen in the future on this property would, would in reality have little direct impact on those low density residential properties to the west. Um, other low density residential properties do exist to the east. They're across Asheville Highway. Uh, and so there is somewhat of a, a buffer there, if you will, if you want to view it that way. So staff's recommendation uh, is approval as presented by the applicant. Uh, the planning board did recommend denial Staff's recommendation, again, is largely based on general compliance with the, with the land use plan, as well as the opportunity for a safer form of development under current floodplain development regulations. The planning board's uh, recommendation of a denial, which was unanimous, 
uh, was based largely on a concern about displacement of the current residents, which is totally a valid concern. Um, I think the applicant is going to speak more to that, and I'll defer to, to, to them on that point. With that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Okay. One question, Josh. Yes, sir. Um, so, in light of the fact that there's a floodplain on the property, the fact that it's already been developed mm -hmm. uh, the way that it has, if it were to be rezoned and some different use were going to be, you know, um, developed on the property, um, it would have to com the new development would have to comply with all of the floodplain regulations that exist today. Yes, there wouldn't be any grandfathering in essence just because there was a previous development. No, sir, no whatsoever. Um, brief summary, any future development, whether it's residential or commercial, would have to be located outside of the floodway, which is the higher velocity area of the floodplain where the, where the stream channel tends to, to be located and where you get the fastest waters. Uh, anything outside of the floodway but still in the floodplain would have to be elevated to t t two feet above base flood elevation, which is FEMA's estimated high water mark in a 100-year flood event. Uh, commercial structures would have, also have to be flood proofed. Um, and there's a whole series of other life safety related requirements that go along with that that would have to be met. Um, any impact to the elevation of the floodplain, so if some of the development were to potentially impact the floodway, say with an improved stream crossing, there would also have to be a no-rise study that proves that the project is not going to create any harmful impact downstream, across stream, or upstream related to the elevation of the flood level, if that makes sense. Question. Um, looking yes, at the maps, I, I would assume that not all of this is in the floodplain. I'm assuming the back part where it shows the uh, tall evergreens. But uh, looking at the map, um, I'm not sure if I'm the, the lower left, but it appears to me to be what would be in the floodplain. Yeah. So the. The, the property is roughly... That's it, but that's not the whole thing. So, so how many homes are impacted by a floodplain? Okay. Or floodway? There, there's differences between floodplain and floodway, right? Yes, sir. So all of the homes are in the, in the floodplain. Some of the homes, at least a portion of them, are also in the floodway. Tell everybody what that means. So, great. Um, so the homes that are located in the floodplain, which again are also, are all of them, are potentially subject to flooding in a major flood event, in a 100-year storm event. 100-year flood. 100-year flood. Um, the structures that are in the floodway are additionally at risk of being severely damaged due to the, to the high-velocity waters that traverse the floodway. So imagine a stream channel uh, in a 100-year event. The stream level rises. You have water in the stream channel that's moving really fast. That's the floodway, and that's where you can have structures destroyed, you can have persons washed away. Um, in the 100-year in the floodplain, which is to either side of that, the water's not moving as fast, but it's elevating and it's backing up and it's ponding. That's really where you get water encroaching into the, the foundation system, into the insulation, into the, the floor, flooring system of the home. So it's not so much lateral movement that you're worried about, it's more just water damaging insulation and electricity. Things so like how that. much of it is in the floodplain? I would estimate roughly one half of the property to be in the floodplain. Okay. Do we know if any construction, uh, if they're planning on building on that, or do we? Do I'm we sorry. Have, do we have any? Do we know if there's, if the uh, commercial developers planning on building on on that, or they just want it for the front? We have no direct knowledge of that. I'll defer to that. And I would, I would uh, just. Just remind the board that we really have to just consider the full spectrum of uses that could occur under the rezoning, yeah. not just whatever a property. I mean, this will be in place for forever until yeah. somebody rezones it. So we have to consider the full spectrum of uses, not just what the current property owner might um, be intending to do. Yeah, and I only ask that because I'm trying to understand how the property. I'm just trying to understand how the property lies. So. Yeah, no, it's a fair question, and if Thank you. Chair. Can I direct you to a map in the packet? I, I see that one. You got it? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So yeah. sure. You're good. Thank you. Move along. I'm done. All right, any other questions at this time, commissioners? All right. Josh, do you have anything else for us now? No, I'll just turn it over to the applicant. Okay. Uh, should we go ahead and start the public hearing when the applicant begins or after the applicant presentation? Okay. All right. <coughs> Good week. 
get the other presentation queued up. While he's doing that, I've got a hard copy I'll hand out to you all. Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, commissioners and, and Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my name is Bob. I host the law firm of McGuire Wood Bissett here in town. I'm here representing David Day, who's the applicant for this rezoning from R3 to, to CS Commercial Services. I want to thank the staff for their good and thorough presentation. I, I don't have a lot to add to that, but I, but I do want to provide a little bit of detail, uh, some additional context and some details about the land use issues, as well as Mr. Day's uh, uh, personal work on this matter, especially with regard to the relocation assistance package that we've offered to the, uh, to, to the, to the current residents of the, of, the, of the mobile home units in there. Um, but first I want to start with some, first I want to start with, just to give you all some context, this is this is look, look, this photograph is looking from the uh, from in, from within the mobile home park up towards Charlotte Highway, and you can see that there's a there's a driveway there. There's just one way in and out, and that's it. Um, and, and and it crosses Gashes Creek. This this photograph was taken from a point slightly beyond he, heading out of <coughs> heading out of the city of Asheville, from slightly beyond the uh, the Fernwood the, the, the Fernwood Park. Uh, and this shows the, uh, uh, the the sort of commercial nature of Charlotte Highway in this area. And it, 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 the further you go to the southeast, it, it just it, it kind of picks up in uh, in frequency and intensity. And intensity, excuse me. Um, this is a photograph looking across the street, and it shows the same the same kind of development right there along Charlotte Highway. Uh, here we're getting into the mobile home park itself, and uh, and and. And, and in between those two, those two units, you can see uh, uh, there's Charlotte Highway. Here's a, and as, as Josh described it, the, the area where the, where the mobile home units are located is relatively flat. Uh, all of it's in the floodplain, and some of it is, is, is in the floodway. It's a, and there's a creek that flows along the backside of the property, so in, 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 a, in a flood event, this can be like a bowl, and, uh, and it, because the property rises up pretty steeply on either side. Um, and anecdotally, we know there have been some rescue efforts there in the past. Uh, here's a close-up of, of, that, of, of that same photograph showing you can see in the distance there that that sort of white apparition behind the tree there is a car on Charlotte Highway, which gives you some idea of how close it is to Charlotte Highway, a major five-lane uh, uh, five road, U.S. Highway. As far as some of the zoning for the uh, zoning, as far as some of the planning justifications for this action that we're requesting, I, I looked a little bit at at, uh, at your comprehensive land use plan, and one of the strategies in there is to adopt zoning for the county that coincides with the land use areas depicted on the proposed comprehensive land use plan, which is Map 12 of your 2016 plan update. Um, that plan update includes the description of things called hubs. There's a hub A and a hub B. Uh, uh, the hub B, you can see, that is, 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 is intended to be for a sort of a, uh, a, 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 a small radius service area for, uh, for the areas around it. Um, this is, a, is, a, photo, is a, a, a detail from the 2006 land use plan map, which is map number 12, the proposed land use map, and it shows a hub B, which is the blue dot right there closest to Asheville. Uh, and, and that's the approximate location of the Fernwood Mobile Home Park. Uh, that's designated in the, in, the, uh, in the 2006 land use plan as a, as, as, as a hub B, which is appropriate for commercial, uh, for, for commercial uses. Now that, the, uh, the 2006 land use plan, as you all know, was pre-zoning, so it, it, there, there, was, there was no zoning associated with this, de with this designation. But the strategy in your current plan calls for, calls for zoning to, to coincide with the designations in the land use plan, and that's that's what we're seeking to do. Uh, here's the here's the statement of district intent from the um, uh, from the ordinance. Josh has already 
to explain this to you, but it is, it, it, it is appropriate for clustered commercial development in order to encourage the concentration of commercial activity in specified areas. Um, and, and, and this is, this property is adjacent to commercial areas. As Mr. Freeman explained, the, uh, the adjacent residential areas uh, are, are uh, they, it is on the directly abutting property, but, they, but there's a good buffer created by the hill and, the, uh, and, 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 and some forest land uh, between the, the, the developable area of this property and, the, and those adjacent residences. So even though it's adjacent, it's, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a natural separation there. Um, this property clearly fits within the, uh, within the strategy of, uh, of your land use plan, uh, and, and, and we think the, com the commercial services zoning is appropriate for it. Um, now, the, the, the planning board and this commission are, uh, are, are right, absolutely right, to be concerned about the potential for displacement of the current residents. Uh, it may not be strictly a land use issue, but it's surely, it's surely a planning concern. We're aware of that. Um, and, and Mr. Day has met with the residents of the mobile home park. He did that on Sunday. I sent you all a report about that. Uh, and offered a generous relocation assistance package uh, to cover moving costs, including moving homes that can moving those homes that can be moved to pay the moving, moving expenses for the households that live in homes that can't be moved. Um, we know that this cannot be a condition of the, of the zoning, but it's, it's a legitimate concern. And in good faith, that's something Mr. Day is, is, is proposing to do. Um, I'll, uh, I, 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 David lives in the community, uh, so do I, and, uh, and, and, we, and we think it's the right thing to do. So, in summary, on my part of it anyhow, uh, this, we think that this, uh, this proposed rezoning is unquestionably consistent with your plans. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's recommended for the subject property, and co commercial use is more appropriate in this area. As Mr. Freeman mentioned, any, in, in response to a question from the chair, any new development will have to comply with the flood damage protection ordinance and prevention ordinance and other environmental ordinance, which the current use does not. And, and we think the relocation assistance available to current residents will address the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the many of the concerns about displacement. So we'd ask for your support. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Day, who can explain a little bit more about his interactions and, and, uh, and, and work with the residents. So Mr. Day is, is from this area. He's, he's a, a contractor and developer. For those of you all familiar with the Fund Depot, he's, he's responsible for that. So uh, we, we think he's done a lot of good in the community, and we'll do good here. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Day, unless you all have any questions for me. Doesn't look like there's any at this time. Okay, and of course, we'll both be here uh, uh, after his presentation and after the public hearing. All right, thank you, Mr. Rice. Hello, I'm David Day. I live in uh, Fairview, uh, out off of Brush Creek Road. Um, and first off, I just want to thank you for your service to Buncombe County. Uh, my wife and I, we've we've been here, and our family. We have four four children and nine grandchildren. We've been here 30 years in Fairview and the Reynolds community, and um, we love our community. Um, we're very active in it and we really want the best for it. And I can truly say that I'm very satisfied with the direction that Buncombe County is going under your leadership and that it's very exciting to live in these times. And so I just did want to say that to let you know that I do appreciate you whether you decide in favor or not. Um, I do ask for your support for the CS uh, rezoning um, this particular piece of property is very important to me because I drive by this property every day on my way to work, on my way home, and I want to see this property developed into something that our community can enjoy. I'm not an out-of-town developer coming in and, you know, just throwing something up. Um, my heart is really in this project. Um, especially I think this property is very important to Fairview and Reynolds because it's one of the very first properties that you see when you come that way. So I think it's very strategic to what people think 
of our community. Um, I believe that the CS zoning is very appropriate for this property and how it should be developed from a land planning uh, perspective and engineering uh, viewpoint as well as being consistent with the comprehensive plan that uh, your planning department, our planning department, has prepared and how Charlotte Highway really should be developed and will over, over time. Um, the planning staff agrees that the property should be rezoned to commercial, you know, for, for I believe the right reasons. I believe that even the planning board would have agreed with the staff if it wouldn't have been for the display, displacement of the 18 families. As of the time of the planning board meeting, I had not had the privilege to meet with the families that live there. Soon after the meeting, I was able to meet with the residents and address their biggest concerns that they had. The two main concerns that they had, I tried to put myself in their situation, is that how long do we have? How long can we have to find you know, our new home? Uh, some of these people have, have lived here for maybe since 1978, I believe, is when uh, David Holdred's family took over the park. Some of them have been there a very long time. There's actually multiple family members living there. So you have siblings and so forth. Um, so their first problem was how long do we have? And then the second problem is that how much money is it going to take for us to relocate where it's not a terrible inconvenience to us and that we're going to be able to get situated in a new home? I'm happy to report that we were able to come together as a developer and as uh, the, the tenants in the mobile home park and find a peaceful solution. We've come together and agreed that rezoning this property to commercial CS rezoning will provide the most value in the development so that each family will receive a relocation package and be able uh, to have 180 days or more to move. Um, if the property uh, stays as residential, you can imagine the, the, the price per acre for commercial land is quite a bit more than residential and honestly there's not money left over when you have a residential community to to try to be generous. I own the property next door and my original intention and intention was to because it, it's already permitted, I'm ready to go, uh, engineered and so forth. But my original intention was to make this phase two of that subdivision. That subdivision's been approved as 17 homes, or you, I, I believe you could have 34 duplex units, because I believe you can have a duplex on each one. So I was going to continue the road that was already been approved into this subdivision, but as we got into it, I really believe that the best use is commercial. So several of the park residents, I believe, are here, um, including uh, Renee, who's the park manager, um, Lewis, who was our translator, but also a resident, a resident there. So I, I encourage you, if, if any of them, you know, if you have any questions, to ask them. Um, also in the audience is uh, the, uh, a real estate agent, Mark Morris, with Beverly Hanks. Um, and he has volunteered to um, help them with locating, um, you know, mobile home parks to move to. And in talking with him, he even has some newer mobile homes that will be able uh, to hopefully replace those six that are pre-HUD. So I'll mention to you what the pre-HUD is. I think it's June 15th of 1976. Any home that is that age or older, those homes, I believe, are not allowed to be moved because they um, have no HUD label. So that uh, causes a you know, terrible inconvenience for those people. Um, so 
at any rate, what we're trying to do is, is help, you know, the people relocate and, and thanks to Mark, he has been in the Fairview community for 40 years, I believe, and has many contacts. So, I hope that you will see that, that I have tried my best as the developer to help the existing residents and to give consideration for what is best uh, for this property. What is the best use for this property? And for the entire community of Fairview. As I endeavor in developing this property, I will do so in a way that I have a market study done to answer some very important questions. The first one is, what does the Fairview Reynolds community really need? The second one is, are there any services that could be provided through this property that aren't currently being met? And then the third one is, how can I develop this prime property that is the first that you see when you come into that community into an aesthetically pleasing uh, you know, property? So when I drive by with my wife in the car, she said, why you know, did you do that? I don't want that to happen. You know? So, I ask for your support in rezoning this property to CS, where I believe it is truly the best use of this property. It is consistent with the planning department's vision, and it provides the best opportunity for the current residents. And I want you to know that my heart is in this development. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Mr. Day, thank you. I don't see any, do we, any initial questions, but uh, stick you. around and we'll uh, call on you if we do. All right, uh, Commission, we need to open the public hearing on this rezoning. So I'm going to um, open the public hearing at 5.55 p.m. And so any members of the public who would like to comment on the proposed rezoning are welcome <coughs> to do so. Uh, we would just ask you to come up to the uh, podium and just let us know your name and where you live and you'll have three minutes to um, comment and you'll get an orange light when I think you have 30 seconds left and then a red light when your three minutes are up and when your time is up we ask you to please stop because we want to get uh, everybody the same amount of time to, to speak to the board. All right, is there anyone who would like to um, comment on the proposed rezoning? Yes ma'am. Good evening. My name is Sherry Barrett and I live at 101 Charlotte Highway. Um, the Fernwood Trailer Park, the uh, land that Mr. Day is referring to that he purchased that borders it would belong to my husband's family and we still live on that property. Um, so we're in very close relation to where all of this has taken place. Um, some of the biggest concerns that we have is traffic. Um, we were once a two-lane road. We are now a four-lane road with a turning lane. It is extremely hard to get in and out of our driveways. I have waited in some instances up to 20 minutes to get out of the driveway. That doesn't happen all the time, but that just shows you at times the level of traffic. Up the road above us, they are putting in an apartment complex called the Reserve at Gashes Creek. Um, I tried to search to find out how many units would be in there, but I was not successful. I couldn't find it anywhere. But the clearing has already begun, which is going to mean more traffic in our area. Uh, I am a native of Buncombe County, and I am saddened to see how Charlotte Highway is becoming concrete and asphalt. It is not, it is not what we in the Reynolds community like to see happening, the amount of development that is going on. We are the main corridor into Fairview. Um, so this is a very heavily trafficked area. Um, as far as the residents having to relocate, I'm very concerned about affordable housing. The reserve at Gashes Creek that I mentioned was supposed to have been slated as affordable housing. I have noticed that the sign has been changed to luxury apartments. So once again, affordable housing has been put on the back burner. 
I'm not sure how these people are going to afford having to move in the Asheville area. Our daughter and grandson moved in with us in February of last year because she, as a pharmacy tech who makes a very good income, cannot afford the housing in Asheville on a single income. And so I don't know how these people are going to go from paying only a lot fee to having to pay the rent in Buncombe County, which is averaging anywhere from $900 to $2,000. And the money that they will get in order to locate is only going to last for so long. And I'm concerned because I see so many people who are homeless on our streets that are not bums. Many of them are people who have jobs. And I don't want to see this happening to families that are in a very close-knit community as they are. We hear laughter and music. We hear them working on each other's properties. And this is a tight-knit community. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, and then, Mr. Yelney, you can go next. Hello, my name is John Thorpe. I live at number 22 in Burnwood, Mobile Home Park. My wife and I bought Karen over here. My wife and I bought the trailer that was already there. We assumed a loan in April of 1989. This April will be there 31 years. Over that time, I have totally remodeled everything in the trailer. Water lines, light switches, kitchen cabinets, countertops, bathroom, the whole nine yards. Um, and I wasn't at the meeting that they had Sunday. I wasn't aware of the meeting. I was at work. Uh, I found out about it the day after, and I didn't go for or against the rezoning because I'm not clear on what is taking place here. One thing I do know is I do not want to move. I hate the fact that we would have to. My wife and I are both in not the best of health. Um, we work part-time, uh, come from meager means and this home is basically all we have. If we have to move out, I have no idea where we go. I'm sure there's many other residents there that don't want to move either, but they don't know where to go, what to do either. I'm very nervous about public speaking, but I do have to say, I had expected to live there the rest of my life. I've so been there almost 31 years. Everybody in the community gets along great. We have a good time. We help each other out. And as far as the flooding, it's never got up above like a foot and a half. It's never entered my home. Uh, it's caused some structural damage, but, you know, we, we fix it. And I only know of one rescue, and that was when there was a retaining wall upstream that had collapsed diverted water into the park and there was a culvert down by the parkway that was clogged so therefore that caused the water to rise. And it did knock a couple of buildings I had off the foundation, moved them back, jacked them up, strapped them down and it's all good now. Um, I just really hate to move. There's nowhere for us to go. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Mr. Delton, you can go next. <coughs> what I have to say is not about the relocation or the moving, because I think you heard it. Most people don't want to move. That's why a lot of us locals will fight to stay where we're at. We'll fight to the bitter end me being one of those. But as I hear these conversations, I see that we pass laws in one center that has to apply throughout the county. And we've got mobile homes that are in the floodway. 
Now, as development occurs upstream in the floodway, and people fill it in to raise their structure above the floodway, what's that going to do to the level of the flood in the mobile home park, folks? It don't take a college degree in environmental science to know exactly what happens. It's raising the water level. So the 100-year floodplain that the government gives you is at best a guess that is not modified and changed each year as more building occurs in the valleys. And all you got to do is look at the city of Asheville. How many houses have been built in valleys, Al, where there used to be a valley that would soak up water? So all I got to say, and I told this to a big developer out there, <clears throat> when he put his parking lot in, I said, don't put a culvert in. Put a concrete, drop it down like this, let the water flow over it, elevate it like this, so the water pushes the concrete in the ground, and when it's flooding, guess what? You can't get in or out. But what happens when it quits raining? You've got no damage. So I don't care what happens here in this park. I just think that we need to provide the technical expertise to minimize the flooding. And if this development is approved, then there should be no building in the flood way. Don't fill it up high because you're creating more flooding downstream. Now if there's any way to develop it and move those mobile homes out of the flood way up to that place where they don't flood, you may have a solution to your whole problem that might even work. So all I'm saying is, think beyond what you're seeing and hearing. Because folks, you're not gonna stop the rain. I don't care how you feel about climate change. You can't control the rain or the flood. You have to work with it. And Kmart, Walmart should have been done the same way. And I made that recommendation at the city council pre-meeting and of course it fell on deaf ears. But I'll keep saying it till you all listen or I die. And I got a feeling I know which will occur first. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Who else would like to speak? Yes, sir. Dr. John Kelly and I live in a neighborhood uh, just a little farther outside of Asheville than the Fernwood Mobile Home Park, uh, the next major residential area um, going uh, in the other direction towards Fairview. So we have a concern there because we have a bridge over the, high, the uh, waterway that leads to the highway that's our only way in or out. However, the bridge has flooded on one occasion, it's had some structural damage, uh, but has been repaired. Uh, if we did have more flooding with backup, that would be certainly a problem for us because it might shut down our access to the homes there, uh, over 20 homes there. I've been there for over 20 years now. Uh, I do I certainly agree that we are developing more and more of a traffic problem. I have also waited quite a long time at times, uh, particularly on the weekend, like Friday afternoon, it starts getting very heavy. Uh, so I think we would be in for some accidents there if there was not a traffic light. Uh, if I, but I do agree the major problem is trying to relocate the pay people that are already there is going to be quite difficult in this uh, economic climate. So I think we do have to consider our neighbors in that way. The uh, idea of more development, as the gentleman previously has mentioned, uh, is probably going to impact uh, such that you know the 100-year uh, flood is going to be more like the 25-year flood. And we've already had some evidence of that uh, in our neighborhood. So I think most of the residents in our neighborhood are not eager to see this without very careful planning as far as future flooding, highway access uh, where we don't put other people at risk. I thankfully have a car that can get out in traffic pretty quick, but I have to use that turn lane to pull into and I don't think that's really what's intended. Uh, it's, I think it's supposed to be turning off the highway, not turning into the highway. But sometimes that's the only way to get out and for being a medical professional, I do need to get out and uh, you know, can't always you know, wait till the very optimum time. 
So I just think we have to be very careful about making this plan and, and consider all the participants. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Rice, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I think your duty as a commissioner is, first of all, health, safety, and welfare. When you look at this development, don't look at the land, don't look at the uh, economic thing, look at the people. If you want to do the economic thing, look at it. How many, how much money would it cost to take care of 17 families and put them in housing somewhere? and do it all the time and talk about it. That's a lot of money. So do the right thing. Turn it down for the people. These are poor people. These ain't people that can just hop out and go get them something. We need to think about the humanitarian side of it. You run for election, you're all out there hugging babies and kissing people. So why don't you do the right thing here? Do it for the people that live there. Not for your personal gain and politics. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, who else would like to speak during public comment? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Mark Morris, um, unequivocally. I am the broker that represents the transaction for Mr. Day. I do live in Fairview. I actually own the commercial building that adjoins the <clears throat> property that's been acquired for future development. And then the next property closer to the parkway would be Fernwood Mobile Home Park. And there are accidents. There is traffic there. There's rear-end collisions just about every week in front of my building. And I do see that. But I'm here to speak my mind and my emotions and to just make a couple of statements or opinions. I was at the meeting Sunday and I will say that it was unanimous that every person there signed in support of the commercial zoning and the relocation package. The other four or five that were not there was because of circumstance because they were at work but I did communicate directly with Renee, the park manager. There are challenges. There is flooding. There are several pre-HUD units that are there that cannot be moved. So the challenges are clear. But let me tell you why all of the people who were present signed this plan on Sunday. Because it was presented with fairness. So let's talk about fairness and why the proposed plan is fair. Number one is compensatory. There's money set aside to take care of the residents. It may not be every dollar that's absolutely necessary, but it's a fair compensation package. It's compassionate. There's rare cases where a developer has spread with a free market. The free market is creating the ability for the developer to compensate and share the benefit of the free market and the transitions that are occurring up and down Charlotte Highway. Many of these units are pre-HUD. I'm working with some other property owners, some park owners in relocating and possibly donating. I do have one commitment for a 1986 manufactured home that can be acquired at zero cost other than the cost to relocate. That would be provided to one of the residents. I'm also working on two other donations of manufactured homes that we need to relocate. There's always a solution to a problem. The problem in this case is how do you balance affordability with public safety? It isn't a floodplain. It isn't a floodway. These residents are in harm way. The conscience would be much greater if there was a death, if there was a casualty, if there was a loss of life because of the flood and these conditions override any sense of affordability. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to ask you to stop. Time's up. Thank you, Thank you for speaking. All right. Um, 
bots, so to speak. Yes, ma'am. I'm Renee Hensley. I live in Lot 20. I'm not good at this. I've been in that park since I was six years old. I'm 53 now. We've had only three incidents that I know that have flooded. The water's gotten up, you know, quite often, but not out of its banks. I feel like that people actually want us gone from there because they think mobile homes are an eyesore. We actually have a, a good looking community for the most part. My father used to live, they lived there before he passed away and he used to keep the, the road on the highway mode and looking good all the time. And now there's another gentleman that's took that over since he died. And most of our homes in there that can be moved are in their 80s. Most parks don't want that old home, they want newer homes. So the, again, we're stuck trying to find a home to live in. And affordable housing is not affordable in Asheville, not for us. That's all. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, anyone else? All right, um, okay, yes, yes ma'am. My name is Rose Anderson. I've lived in Asheville about 10 years. We live in the neighborhood Charlotte Forest, which is behind the mobile home park. And I'm very concerned for these residents. Uh, in fact, my whole neighborhood is concerned for these residents. There's four or five of us here from my neighborhood. Um, they're a quiet mobile home park. Uh, there's no drugs, no drama there. They're nice neighbors. We, we are happy to have them near us. And affordable housing in Asheville, is, it's not there. Um, I guess you guys know that. Um, the reallocation package these people have been offered, maybe y'all should ask them what that is. I understand it's not very much. Um, the residents maybe could answer those questions a little bit better because I wasn't at the meeting. I've only heard it secondhand, but I hear it's anywhere from $2,500 to $6,000. And um, you can't even pay first and last month's rent for an apartment for that. So. Uh, that, that, that's just not going to cut it in, uh, in Asheville. So I, I just wanted to say that um, I feel like uh, we need to vote for people to have homes, and these people need homes. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Anderson. All right, is there anyone else who would like to speak before we adjourn the public hearing? Appreciate everyone coming out. I want to hear from anybody who's got anything they'd like to say. But if there's not, I'm going to adjourn the public hearing at 6, 16, all right, uh, commissioners, um, are there any questions at this time or a motion? Uh, I have some questions. <clears throat> you might not be able to hear me. I live in Fairview, too. 53 years. It's a long time to live there. I live there when it's two lane road. I've been there for 30 years. The five lane road, you know, turning and stuff, that doesn't bother me. I get out where I live, a lot of traffic, I make it out easy. But the affordable housing part, Mr. Day, I wish there's something that we could do because that's 18 homes. They may not be the best homes, I don't know what you're paying for the property, and I don't really care. And she's right. I used to come up through there, and every week there'd be grass real high at the end of the guardrail. And you've been driving it too, and the grass was cut all the way up to going into the entrance above and up on that hill. And I thought somebody is really taking care of this, taking care of this. <clears throat> You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. I understand that. Am I? I was for it in a way, but then I look at certain people, and it takes that point away from me. 
You know, it only takes three people, and people are right in their own in their own forms. And I'm sorry, but I've been sitting up here working for poor people, elderly people, for how long? They're not elderly, but the man I have a whole lot. Gentleman's got 31 years in down there. He hasn't lost a lot yet. You know, I've seen it. I remember when they built the wall, you know, when it's done the five lane, and they did the wall. And they're right before you get to the park. So I've seen it all. I've seen how they made a five lane road. They blew up rocks, they blew up, I mean, they blew up everything. I understand that we're getting more neighbors, and I understand everything in Asheville or Buncombe County, or, or not Asheville, but in Sky, uh, Skyland or Fairview. There's nothing getting cheaper. Probably not even this property. And I understand you want to do something to the property beside it, and I understand that you would have to build this property up to get it in effect, usable for whatever. One of the hardest decisions I'm going to make, and I've got to sit here and think about it a little longer, but I look at these people, and it's not because the lady spoke about the traffic, and it's not because you spoke about you would like to bring the property to this. It's about the people. There's four that did show up. And I don't know what to say to them. Can I just go ahead and say, well, you're just going to have to move. Well, I understand moving to Nashville or Buncombe County is not the easiest thing to do. And moving a, a trailer or a mobile home from, you know, they're basically saying, it's all, all of my bombs in there, single, single whites. Somebody's not listening. It does, uh, single whites. They single whites. Is there, is there one double, double white in there? Yeah. Let, let me just say for the record, we just had a, a presentation earlier that had this uh, uh, ability to be able to see in someone's kitchen window. And when I zoom in on this, I can't see whether it's a... Uh, get a metal roof or a shingle roof. So I'd like to be able to do that on this, if we can do that on, on the taxpayer. But I won't go on that. On that. I, won't, I won't run that rabbit, but anyhow. But I'm not if against... If you're not one double white, I'm sorry, Commissioner Fryer. That's no problem. I'm not against anyone in this deal. I want people to understand that. And I live in your district. But I live in their district too. And it's not for a vote. I think I could care less about a vote. I've sat up here and cared for people the best I can for seven years. And i got one year left. And I'm going to have to continue to do that. So I'm going to sit here and think about it and listen to the rest of it. But we'll see what I have to say when I'm done. But I am here. You know, I've seen things happen in the last month that you wouldn't believe happened. But they have. And I just have to think about it, sir. Thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Um, any other questions from commissioners, or is there a motion? So, Commissioner Fryer did ask a question. Is there, is there, is there not a, um, so there's not a, not one, there's not a double white on there to. There is one double white. Yeah, I can see it. There is one. There is one double wide. When you turn in on the entrance, it's there on the right. Isn't it? Okay. Uh, Mr. Belcher, do you have a question or further comment? Well, I, I'll, I'll make I'll make a few comments. Um, so. And here everybody's, here's, here's what's interesting about this. Uh, I've actually met, met Mr. Day at one of my grandkids' funnest places to go at, at Fun Depot. And I'm, and I'm sure you and your family are just you know, wonderful people. And I think everything that you've said has been very genuine. Uh, also know that to, yeah, I'm not going to make my decision based on what I'm getting ready to say, that 
Um, when you have a home and you own a home and you open the door to that home, it's, it's your house. And, and basically relocating a manufactured home is basically um, means that you, you have to step into, I mean, you're, you're totally stepping into, it, it's just not that easy just moving a house and, and putting it somewhere. Um, and also recognize that a pre-76 HUD, I think the rules are you, can, you can't move it, but you know, once you're, you're in the house, you're taking care of it, you know, it can, it can outlast me or anybody. So all those things that have been said are true. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've looked at the property. I, look, I, am, uh, I think that, in, in my opinion, the property is not as well suited uh, for, uh, for commercial development as some folks might think. Um, I think everybody's speaking uh, from their heart, you know, this evening. Um, and I and I think after weighing, and I, I've, I've run through these, while y'all are sitting up here, if y'all see me looking down, I've been running through these maps back and forth and looking left, you know, left and right of that property up there. And I have some concerns about it being turned into commercial. So, so for that, those reasons, I'll be voting no. Or we don't have a motion yet. Not yet. No. Commissioner Belcher and Somebody's the rest of the board. Motion, so. Yes, but first, before the statute requires, before you uh, turn to the motion on whether to zone, to rezone or not, you need to adopt a consistency statement. And there's two. One stating that uh, the the rezoning plan is inconsistent with the comprehensive land use plan, and one stating that it's consistent with it because there are different portions of the plan that this this project does. Um, a meet. Some are consistent and some are inconsistent. I think Josh so, had those up. Yeah, so I've been listening to that for seven years and it still confuses me on how it's, to it's, It is confusing, but what the statute said is you have to adopt one um, prior to yeah. considering whether you're going to rezone or not. So I'm going to make a motion that it's inconsistent with the county's comprehensive land use plan and for that reason would not be reasonable in the public interest. Is that what motion I need to make? Make. That is the motion you. you could make. I'll say. Yeah. All right. Put the motion in second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I don't know what motion to make. I mean, what do I have to do? <laughs> There's a resolution to deny, in your package, to deny. Well, and there's also an ordinance. It's silly for those of you that are out there. It's just kind of confusing. We want to make sure we do it right. So where is the resolution? Look under the ordinance. Denied. Uh, there it is. You see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, let me just I'll jump in. Uh, I'll ahead. make a motion uh, to approve the resolution denying a request to amend the official zoning map of Duncan County. Uh, on the proposed property to deny the rezoning. Yes. yes. I second. All right. Further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed to the motion. All right. It passes. All right. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, both sides of the issue who who spoke to this. We appreciate hearing everyone's concerns about this. Uh, so thank you for uh, coming out this evening. All right, and if, and if folks want to stay, of course, you're welcome to, but if you don't want to, we appreciate that as well. Um, but if you, so if you choose to leave, just, we do need to move on to our next business, so just, uh, can I say uh, yes, yes, you can. So, I want to make sure that there's no one in the room that they understand what happened. You understand what happened? Or are you confused? The property will remain zoned as it is currently. Yes, I just want to make sure, because it is, it was, I didn't think okay. it were, but that's, that's why I want to say that. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Uh, Ms. Pinder, I do have any reports? Yes, All right. We have the old business. The first item under new business is uh, a follow up on the Catholic Charities request item that we discussed at our previous meeting. And um, 
Ms. Pender will I can speak to this item. I can tee it off for you. Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, I received a letter from Catholic Charters requesting written consent to continue their refugee resettlement program here in our county. Um, so you have the letter in your packet, and you also have a copy of the executive order that was written in November, in last September, requiring written consent by the county and the state permitting refugees to be resettled in our in our county. So the question for the board tonight is: Would you? review that and give us guidance as a staff to sign that letter allowing refugees to come. I would say in the letter you would notice that last year, well, 2018, Catholic Charities placed 44 refugees in our county. All right, thank you very much. Um, and there's the, um, there was a representative from the organization at the previous meeting. I don't believe there's anyone here this evening. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, sure. All right, commissioners, are, any, are, there, are there any questions or a motion, and I believe that I believe there's a couple ways we could do it. But maybe the simplest way would be to uh, to delegate authority to the county manager to uh, execute a letter. So, or, or or the chair, but you know, let's just reckon if, let's just use the manager. Okay, so I only have I have uh, this this came up. I think this came up before. Okay, now okay. what we did? Okay, what well, it was very it was pretty tough when it came up. Forward because um, the, the conversation we had uh, that, that brought this up to us again was that we had some um, uh, families here now that were uh, from the Russian Ukrainian community, right? Is that correct? Okay, that's what that's what was said, and that the purpose of this was to to give permission to unite them with their families. Correct. Correct. When the lady was here last time, she shared with me that she relocates families. So the families that are here are requesting their families to come. Okay. It's how they would do that. I just want to make sure that that that's what we're doing. That's what we're allowing the county manager to do. That it's not doing a open letter in the future to do more than that without it, the commissioners knowing. Is that correct? Correct. I read it, but yeah. I also read zoning stuff. No question. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I I did read it, and it is not specific in that it just says. Um, and I guess the result of the executive order is that that it can't be done unless we get permission. All right, that's all the question I have. Does anyone want to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we authorize the county manager to enter into the extended partnership. A second. A second. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the motion? Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, and the next item is a budget amendment for the Governor's Crime Commission grant. And Rachel Nygaard and Jennifer Barnett will share some information with us about this one. Thank you, and good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, actually, if there are specific questions related to the grant, Content. Diana Sierra, who is the um, program, coordinator. yes, thank you, family justice coordinator, is present to answer those questions. Um, but we bring before you this evening a budget amendment request, um, which would additionally, if you approve the budget amendment request, would enable us to um, receive the grant award. Um, but this is a continuation grant. Uh, for the Buncombe County Family Justice Center through the Governor's Crime Commission. The amount of the award is $1,182,882.85. $1, $182, for budgetary purposes, we would round that to $878. This is a two-year grant fund. This grant is funded through the Victims um, of Crime Act, so VOCA, Again, it supports the continued services 
um, that are already in existence through the Family Justice Center, um, through partnerships with our, the existing agencies that are already housed with the Family Justice Center. Um, it is funds in support of nine contracted positions through those organizations uh, to provide comprehensive trauma-informed programming for victims of domestic and sexual violence at the Family Justice Center. It will additionally fund travel and registration for on-site partners to attend the National Family Justice Center Alliance Conference where they receive training on domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, and elder abuse in the context of the Family Justice Center model and accountability to survivors. The required 20% local match is met through the in-kind donation of office space um, at the Family Justice Center and um, with the Family Justice Center coordinator's salary. So the request is to um, enable us to budget both the expenditures for this two-year grant award um, and, the re and to receive the revenue. If there's any specific questions about the grant. The question I have is, this does not commit us for anything after two years. And That's these are contract employees. That is correct, and they're actually not contract employees for the county. We actually engage in a contract with the partner agencies who are housed at the Family Justice Center and they employ the individuals. Okay. So we have a motion and second to approve the budget amendment. All in favor please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's worked on continuing to uh, uh, make this a really successful program and to secure these uh, additional funds. So it says a lot about the um, says a lot about the work we're doing here. All right, we have um, on the board appointments two uh, positions on the Women's Commission that are vacant. These are the only two, two applications we got? Correct. Well, that makes it easy. I'd like to nominate uh, Claudia Jimenez and Nora Sheff to join the Women's Commission. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. We now come to um, public comment um, about any other items. And Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Oh. Can I just mention one thing? Yeah. Um, at the last meeting, um, we talked about interviews for the Greenway Parks and Recreation. Yes. So I want to make sure that um, we mention that and see if y'all have decided on the interview time frame. Yes. And we. And this was in 2019, so we said that we would possibly try to do that in the first few weeks of January. Do we want to try to find a time right now to do that? Is that okay with you? Um, we, we could, of course, look at the time prior to our next meeting as one option. When, when is it? That's going to be on Tuesday. 21st. 21st. Um, we do have a specially called housing committee meeting that day, right? Did we talk about that at the committee meeting today? Um, but uh, do we know how long that's going to last? No, we know. Um, we don't. Could, I mean, if we could plan on keeping it to. <coughs> I kind of like to do it on that Tuesday. We're going to all be here, so why don't we. Why don't we um, I mean, how many are, are we in here? Yeah. Uh, it's going to take a couple of hours for sure. I think there were at least double digits. I think it was around 12 individuals. Do we have to do a briefing? Sorry. What do you mean, a briefing? Well, there's a gender briefing with commissioners. That the pre meeting? Pre meeting, yeah. Pre meeting. Can we, I think we're going to need to um, either not do that or make it shorter and move it closer to the regular meeting time so that we, because I think we need that afternoon to do interviews. Is that, would that be agreeable to um, try to That same day? Okay. Well, 
why don't we say this? Why don't we have our housing meeting from one to two? We'll do we'll do interviews. We may not get through all of them though. We're just gonna have to look at the time, so we don't have to do all the math and that um, okay. on, on the spot. But why, why don't we just plan on everyone being here from two until the regular meeting starts, and we'll we'll see what all we can fit in those three hours. Can we move our affordable housing meeting earlier? I would be open to that. I'm, I'm fine with that. Why don't we do that from 11 to 12? Let's do it. The staff's yes. okay with that. And then we can start yeah, at 1 yes. o'clock yeah. with interviews, and hopefully we can get our, uh, we're going to review, do a review of um, uh, our clerk and our finance director that afternoon. Mr. Chair, yes, uh, we'll just get with Lamar. We will adjust the, uh, the, the publication in terms of the time for the, um, the Housing for the Committee meeting itself. Okay, so we'll is make that happen. We're, is this one we were going to bring in the outside folks on? No, that's okay. a separate meeting. Great, right. thank you. Very good. Yeah, I'm good with that. Lunch? So let's just do um, that. Yeah, I think if we're going to be starting that early and we have a meeting before so that people don't have to leave and go find food, that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we plan on starting over? All right, sound good? Sound like a plan? I also want to just mention that we are probably going to do have the same process for the strategic planning grant, so I just want to put that out there. So be thinking about time frame for that as well. Let's, let's work on it yeah, for the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Same, same thing. Let's just get ahead of it. I mean, generally the Tuesdays are good, but sometimes we do have other meetings that might just, that we're after this might not be free. So we'll just have to, let's take that up at the next meeting though and we'll select the date. Um, just wanted to put that up right. there. So how many did we come down with? Uh, well, Turn your mics on. Oh. Wondering how many uh, we will have that day, 12? It was between 10 and 12. I'm not really 100% sure. Still, it doesn't matter. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take Okay. And just so since we have so many, why don't we just talk for just a minute about the, uh, how much time we're going to give to this. Um, my recommendation would be that we do 10-minute um, interviews. That we allocate 10 minutes for each for each interview. I know that's not a lot when we have this many, you know, I think you just, um, if you have additional questions, you can always call folks, speak to them outside this process, but in terms of the group interviews, it will still be two, at least two hours. For this purpose, and that would be um, that be my suggestion. What do uh, others think? Do you want to have a timer? Yeah, yeah. I oh, think we just try to give everyone the same amount of time. Yeah, we're just gonna need to keep it focused. I think if you and, um, if you do if you do ten minutes for the interview, you're probably okay. But you know, everybody's shaking everybody's hands. You know, I mean, if you if you give them ten minutes, you hit the button. They got ten minutes. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Now we'll play the interview. All right. Very good. All right, now we come to public comment. So uh, if there's any folks who would like to speak to the board, please uh, feel free. You're gonna have three minutes. Mr. Yelton, you can go first. And you've got three minutes. Uh, let us know your name, where you live. Uh, when you get an orange light, you've got 30 seconds left. And when the red light goes off, for three minutes is up, and we ask that folks conclude then so we give everyone the same amount of time. I don't even think I'll use my three minutes tonight. Boy, if I don't, I'm slipping up. I always time it perfectly. Um, I'd like to know where in Buncombe you don't have a traffic problem. Simple question. Where in Buncombe don't you have a traffic problem? You've been on 26 of the morning coming in at 7.30. You're stopping at New Stock Road or the other side of that because if they have had a bump up at New Stock Road, it backs up to Weaverville. I remember Ken Bible on radio one time says, oh, we won't have no problem with traffic in Asheville. When you're building apartments all over the place, your advertiser is the number three place in the nation to rent. Come on, all you rich folks. No wonder we got traffic problems because half those cars have got Florida license plates, New Jersey license plates, Georgia license plates, and we talk about affordable housing. Folks, if you drink water in Asheville and flush your commode, you're subsidizing public housing. Now, if you want to know how that's done, see me after this because I won't tell the public how that's done, but it's done. And every time you give 2.2 million to HUD or to Habitat for Humanity, where does that money come from? Us. 
all of us in this room, you plus everybody that should be out here. And every time you do that, what are you doing to the cost of housing? And every time you pass a law and say you got to do this, you got to do that, if it's not a wise choice, you increase the price of housing. I bring up that flooding thing again. I'd like to see this guy come back with this and say, we're going to redo this whole thing. We're going to take this. We're going to put a commercial area next to it, and then we're going to find a place for those 17 homes and cut a deal with a mobile home dealer that's probably up there on the board that would find some real nice used homes, and he sets up a nice little community right next to where there's a bunch of jobs, and some of those people might have better jobs. But you know what that's called? Creative thinking, flexibility which is one thing that government does not have. And I mean it, and I will say it. And I'll say it as long, Brownie, as you allow public comment. Appreciate you taking comment on your actions tonight, too. And I'll say it until the day I die. And I'm telling you, folks, if you don't start listening, you're going to dig the hole deeper, you know, that's no way to get out of a hole, is it? Dig it deeper. Dig it deeper. More money. More taxes. Give more away. Thank you very much. I didn't use up all my time. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Rice, and then Mr. Sullivan. Go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. That's my boy Don. You know him? He's really good. He ought to be sitting up there and, and, and taking some of you down. Uh, I'm getting a head start, Don. You need to help me out now. You need to help me out. We got a real, real start here in the pre meeting. We talked about reevaluation year 21 or 2021. I want you to start talking about your campaign trail and how you're going to give the taxpayers some relief. I want that to be your issue on your taxes, you know, going out here and telling people what you're going to do. I heard the technology uh, in the pre-meeting that uh, technology uh, kind of lowers the cost on everything. But let me show you something. In a reevaluation year, have you ever seen the taxes decrease that come in to Buncombe County? Did you ever see the budget decrease? I mean, these are just simple questions. What are you doing with the money? All the extra money that comes in, somebody's got a pet peeve project, a pork barrel or something, to spend it on. Where's the savings at? I tell you where it's going now, it's going to lawyers. It's going to people out here that stole from the county. And it's going to get even worse. It's going to be spending more of your money. Taxpayers' money. So what I'd like to ask you right now is to start thinking about what a good decrease in taxes you're going to give me. I'm one of the residents. Where are you going to give me a decrease in taxes? Don't tell me what you're going to spend it on. Tell me how you're going to decrease it. Don't they look big for a third time? They don't know what to think about this. We need commissioners that are thinking about how to decrease, not increase. And we're going to bring up some other subject uh, in the very near future about everyone that's sitting up there and how your salary has increased. So be thinking about that. I'll be back. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Sullivan. That's my day. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, a member of the board, uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, and my partner and I own a small retail store just a few blocks from here. I live in the Riceville section. I'm also one of the City of Asheville's appointed representatives to the Tourism Development Board. And I'm here this evening to give you some of my thoughts on the current process to review the occupancy taxes. As you discuss projects and options for the occupancy tax, 
I'd like to help by dispelling a few myths that are out there. The first myth is that hotels impose the excuse me, occupancy tax on themselves so they, could get, so they should get to decide how it's spent. In the first case, not a single hotel or Airbnb pays any occupancy tax. They just collect the money from the customers. Secondly, while they have uh, requested that the tax be imposed, they are using the county and the full force of our government to collect the tax from the customers. As long as they are using taxes as a way to collect money, we the people should have a say in how it's spent. The second myth I'd like to dispel is that there's some sort of gap between what the people in our county want and what the people in the hospita hospitality industry want. People in the hospitality, hospitality industry want affordable housing and transportation just as much as people in the rest of the county. The only gap that exists at the moment is between what the people in our county want and what some of the hotel lobbyists tell us we are able to ask for. The third myth I'd like to dispel is that we can only spend the occupancy tax on certain things. That is simply not true. While most counties abide by the general guidelines, there are North Carolina counties that spend money on non-tourism related items. However, you need to give lawmakers in Raleigh a good, really good reason why you should be allowed to spend the money differently. Buncombe County has that really good reason. More than 3% of the housing stock in Asheville is Airbnbs. That's just not the highest percentage in North Carolina, it's the highest percentage in the nation. The tourism industry is directly affecting the ability of our residents to house themselves. If Buncombe County is going to continue to collect these occupancy taxes and help our area market itself, we should be using some of those taxes to help ameliorate the effects that it's having on our area. I stand here this evening as someone who benefits from the tourism area every single day where people who come into my shop downtown. And I think that we need more money on long-term spending for our community and less on short-term spending on marketing. This commission is in a unique position to demand that change. You hold the power of the purse and I ask that you use that power to request more than just a little money for a few projects around the county. Please use that power to help those who are most adversely affected by the changes that have taken place with the increased popularity of our area. Commissioner Fryer is quoted in the papers wanting to seek re-election to help seniors on fixed incomes and poor people. What better way to help these populations than to use some of those occupancy taxes to try to make it a bit easier for those struggling? Standing up here and talking is easy. Posting on social media is easy. I recognize that governing is hard and even harder when trying to find an agreement between county, city, and state lawmakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. All right, anyone else? All right, thank you all, to, thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, we have a couple of announcements. Um, Jasmine, you have an announcement for today. Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that this Thursday, January 9th, the Early Childhood Education and Development Committee will be having a community outreach meeting. Um, that will be from 3.30 to 5 p.m. at Dr. Wesley Grant Senior Southside Center at 285 Livington Street. Uh, Commissioner Whiteside, Vice Chair Presley, and myself will be there along with members from the committee. The goal is to meet with community members, answer questions, um, and help people uh, get a lot of information about the ongoing application process. We hope to see folks there. All right, thank you very much. And on January 21st at 3 p.m., actually, we just said we're not going to do this. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> on January 21st at 5 p.m., the county commissioners will have their regularly scheduled meeting at 200 College Street, room 326 in downtown Asheville. As we discussed earlier, we anticipate having interviews with applicants for the County Greenways Committee earlier that day. Those are public meetings, so anybody who's interested may attend uh, those interviews. All right, um, we are, is there a motion to adjourn? All in favor, please say aye. 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 We're adjourned.